from around the globe. It's the Cube, presenting enterprise digital resilience on hybrid and multi-cloud. Brought to you by IOTAHO. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our continuing series covering data automation. Brought to you by IOTAHO. Today, we're going to look at how to ensure enterprise resilience for hybrid and multi-cloud. Let's welcome in AJ Vahora, who's the CEO of IOTAHO. AJ, always good to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Great to be back, David. Pleasure. And he's joined by Fadzi Ushewakunze, who is a global principal architect for financial services, the, the vertical of financial services at Red Hat. He's got deep experiences in that sector. Welcome, Fadzi. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Fadzi, let's start with you. Look, there are a lot of views on cloud and what it is. I wonder if you could explain to us how you think about what is a hybrid cloud and, and how it works. Sure, yes. So um, a hybrid cloud is an IT architecture that incorporates some degree of uh, workload portability, orchestration and management across uh, multiple clouds. Uh, those clouds could be private clouds or public clouds or even your own data centers. And uh, how does it all work? It's all about secure interconnectivity and on-demand allocation of resources across clouds. And uh, separate clouds can become hybrid when they are seamlessly interconnected. And it is that interconnectivity uh, that allows the workloads, uh, workloads to be moved and how management can be unified and orchestration can work. And uh, how well you have these interconnections has a direct impact on how well your hybrid cloud will work. Okay, so, well, Fadzi, staying with you for a minute. So in the early days of cloud, that term private cloud was thrown a lot, uh, around a lot, but it often just meant virtualization of an on-prem system and a network connection to the public cloud. Let's bring it forward. What, in your view, does a modern hybrid cloud architecture look like? Sure, so uh, for modern uh, hybrid um, uh, clouds, uh, we see that um, teams or organizations need to focus on uh, the portability of applications across clouds. That's very important, right? And when uh, uh, organizations build applications, they need to build and deploy these applications as small collections of independently loosely coupled services and then have those things run on the same operating system, which means, in other words, running it on Linux everywhere and building cloud native applications and being able to manage and orchestrate uh, these applications with platforms like Kubernetes or uh, Red Hat OpenShift, for example. Okay, so that's, that's, Fadzi, that's definitely different from building a monolithic application that's fossilized and, and doesn't move. So what are the challenges for customers to, you know, to get to that modern cloud as, as you've just described it? Is it skill sets? Is it the ability to leverage things like containers? What's your view there? So, I mean, from what we've seen around, um, around the industry, especially around financial services, where I uh, spend most of my time, we see that um, the first thing that we see is management, right? Now, because you have all these clouds and all these applications, you have a massive array of connections, of interconnections. You also have massive array of uh, integrations, uh, portability and resource allocations as well. And then orchestrating all those different moving pieces, things like storage networks and things like those are really difficult to manage, right? That's one, what, uh, so management is the first challenge. The second one is workload placement. Uh, placement. Where do you place this cloud? How do you place this um, cloud native application? Do you, what do you keep on site or on-prem? And what do you put in the cloud? That is the, the, the other um, uh, challenge. The major one, the third one is security. Security now becomes the key challenge and concern for most customers. And we can talk about how to address that. Yeah, we're definitely going to dig into that. Let's bring AJ into the conversation. AJ, you know, you and I have talked about this in the past. One of the big problems that virtually every company face is, is data fragmentation. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about how IO Tahoe unifies data across, you know, both traditional systems, legacy systems, and it connects to these modern IT environments. Yeah, sure, Dave. I mean, uh, Fadsi just nailed it there. It used to be about data, the, the volume of data uh, and the different types of data, but uh, as applications become more connected and interconnected, uh, the location of that data really matters, how we serve that data up to those, those apps. So working with Red Hat in our partnership with Red Hat, being able to inject our data discovery, machine learning into these multiple different locations, whether it be an AWS or an IBM cloud or a GCP or on-prem, being able to automate that discovery 
and pulling that that single view of where is all my data then allows the CIO to manage costs. They can do things like when I keep the data where it is on premise or in my Oracle cloud or in my IBM cloud and connect the application that needs to, to feed off that data. And the way in which we do that is you know, machine learning that learns over time as it recognizes different types of data, applies policies to, to classify that data and um, brings it all together with, with automation. Right, and that's one of the big themes, and we've talked about this on earlier uh, episodes, is really simplification, really abstracting a lot of that heavy lifting away so we can focus on things, AJ, as, as you just mentioned. I mean, Fadzi, one of the big challenges that, of course, we all talk about is governance across these disparate data sets. I'm, I'm curious as your thoughts, how does Red Hat really think about helping customers adhere to corporate edicts and compliance regulations, which of course are, are particularly acute within financial services. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So um, for banks and uh, payment providers, like you've just mentioned there, insurers and uh, many other financial services firms, um, you know, they have to adhere to uh, standards such as say uh, PCI DSS and in Europe, you've got the G, uh, GDP, uh, GDPR, uh, which requires stringent tracking, reporting, documentation, and, uh, you know, for them to, to remain in compliance. And the way we recommend our customers to address these challenges is by having an automation strategy. Right, and uh, that type of strategy can help you to improve the security and compliance of uh, of your organization and reduce the risk uh, to the business. Right, and uh, we help organizations build security and compliance uh, from the start with our consulting services, residencies. We also offer courses that uh, help customers to understand how to address some of these uh, challenges. And there's uh, also we help organizations build uh, security into their applications with our open source middleware. Um, uh, middleware offerings and uh, even using a platform like OpenShift because uh, it allows you to run legacy applications and also containerized applications in a unified platform. Right, and also that provides you with, um, you know, uh, uh, with the automation and the tooling that you need to continuously monitor, manage and automate the systems for security and compliance purposes. AJ, hey anything, any color you could add to this conversation? Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased Fadsy brought up OpenShift. I mean, we're using OpenShift to be able to take that security uh, application of controls to, to the data level. And it's all about context. So understanding what data is there, being able to assess it to say, who should have access to it, which application permission should be applied to it. Um, that's, um, that's a great combination of Red Hat and Itaho. But see, what about multi-cloud? Doesn't that complicate the situation even, even further? Maybe you could talk about some of the best practices to apply automation across, you know, not only hybrid cloud, but, but multi-cloud as well. Yeah, sure, yeah. So the right automation uh, solution, you know, can be the difference between, you know, cultivating an automated enterprise or automation chaos. And um, some of the recommendations we give our clients is to look for an automation platform that can offer the first thing is complete support. So that means have an automation solution that, prov that provides, um, you know, promotes IT availability and reliability with your platform so that you can provide, uh, you know, enterprise grade support, including uh, security and testing integration and clear roadmaps. The second thing is, vendor interoperability in that uh, you are going to be integrating multiple clouds. So you're going to need a solution that can connect to multiple clouds seamlessly, right? And with that comes the challenge of maintainability. So you, you, you're going to need to look into a automation uh, a solution that, that is easy to learn or has an easy learning curve. And then the fourth idea that we tell our customers is scalability. In the, in the uh, uh, hybrid cloud um, uh, space, scale is, is the big, big deal here. And um, you need a, to deploy an automation solution that can span across the whole enterprise in a consistent, consistent manner, right? And then also that allows you finally to uh, integrate the multiple data centers that you have. 
So AJ, I mean, this is a complicated situation for, a, if a customer has to make sure things work on AWS or Azure or Google, uh, they're going to spend all their time doing that. How, <laughs> what can you add uh, really to simplify that, that multi-cloud and hybrid cloud equation? Yeah, I, I can give um, a few customer examples here. One being a, a manufacturer that we've worked with to drive that simplification um, and the real bonuses for them has been a reduction in cost. We worked with them late last year to bring the cost spend down by $10 million in 2021 so they could hit that reduced budget. And um, what we brought to that was the ability to deploy using OpenShift templates into their different environments, whether it was on-premise and um, or in, as you mentioned, AWS, they, they had GCP as well for their marketing team. And across those different platforms, being able to use a template, use pre-built scripts to get up and running and catalog and discover that data within minutes, it takes away the legacy of having teams of people having to, to jump on workshop calls. And I know we're all on a lot of uh, Teams, Zoom calls. Um, in, in these current times. There just simply isn't enough hours in the day to, to manually perform all of this. So um, yeah, working with Red Hat, applying machine learning into those templates, those little recipes that we can put that automation to work, regardless of which location the data's in, allows us to um, pull that unified view together. Great, thank you. Fazi, I want to come back to you. So in the early days of cloud, you're, you're in the Big Apple, you know financial services really well. Cloud was like an evil word in, within financial services. And obviously that's, that's changed, it's evolved. We talk about the pandemic has even accelerated that. Um, and when you really you know, dug into it, when you talk to customers about their experiences with, with security in the cloud, it, it, was, it was not that it wasn't good, it was great, whatever, but it was different. And there's always this issue of, of skill, lack of skills and multiple tools, SecOps teams are really overburdened. Uh, uh, but it, but in the cloud requires you know, new thinking. You've got the shared responsibility model. Uh, you've got to obviously uh, have specific corporate you know, requirements and compliance. So. This is even more complicated when you introduce multiple clouds. So what are the differences that you can share from your experiences running on a sort of either on-prem or on a mono cloud um, or, you know, in, in versus across clouds? What, what, what do you suggest there? Sure, um, you know, because of these complexities that you've explained here, um, misconfigurations and um, uh, the in, in inadequate change control are the top security threats. So human error is what we want to avoid because as, you know, as your clouds grow with complexity and you put humans in the mix, then the um, rate of errors is going to increase and that is going to expose you to security threats. So this is when automation comes in because automation will streamline and increase the consistency of your infrastructure management, uh, also application development and even security operations to improve in, uh, your protection, compliance and change control. So um, you want to consistently configure resources according to a pre-approved, uh, um, you know, pre-approved policies, and uh, you want to proactively uh, maintain um, them in a, in, a, in a repeatable fashion over the whole life cycle. And then you also want to rapidly identify systems that require patches and, and reconfiguration and automate that process of patching and reconfiguring so that you don't have humans doing this type of thing, right? And you want to be able to easily apply patches and change uh, a system settings according to uh, a predefined baseline, like I, like I explained before, in, you know, with the pre-approved policies. And also you want ease of auditing and troubleshooting. Right. And from a rated perspective, we provide tools that enable you to do this. We have, for example, a tool called uh, Ansible that enables you to automate data center uh, operations and security and also deployment of applications. And also OpenShift itself you know, automates most of these things and obstructs the human beings from putting their fingers uh, and causing, uh, uh, you know, potentially introducing errors. Right. Now, in looking into the you know, new world of multiple clouds, and so forth, the differences that we're seeing here between running a single cloud or on-prem is three main areas, which is control, security, and compliance, right? Control here, it means if you're on-premise or you have one cloud, 
um, you know, in most cases, you have control over your data and your applications, especially if you're on-prem. However, if you're in the public cloud, there is a difference there. The ownership it is still yours, but your resources are running on somebody else's or the public clouds, you know, AWS and so forth, uh, infrastructure. So people that are going to do this need to really, uh, especially banks and governments, need to be aware of the regulatory constraints of running uh, those applications in the public cloud. And we also help customers rationalize some of these choices. And also on security, you will see that uh, if you're running on premises or in a single cloud, you have more control, especially if you're on-prem, you can control the sensitive information that you have. However, in the cloud, that's a different uh, situation, especially from personal information of employees and things like that. You need to be really careful of that. And also, again, we help you rationalize some of those choices. And then the last one is compliance. As well, you see that if you're running on-prem or in single cloud, um, regulations come into play again, right? And if you're running on-prem, you have control over that. You can document everything. You have access to everything that you need. But if you're gonna to go to the public cloud, again, you need to think about that. We have automation and we have standards that can help you, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, address some of these challenges for security and compliance. So that's really strong insights, Fadzi. I mean, first of all, Ansible has a lot of market momentum. You know, Red Hat's done a really good job with that acquisition. Your point about repeatability is critical because you can't scale otherwise. And then that idea you were, you were putting forth around control, security, and compliance, it's so true. It, as I called it, the shared responsibility model. And there was a lot of misunderstanding in the early days of cloud. I mean, yeah, maybe AWS is going to physically secure the you know, S3 but in the bucket, but we saw so many misconfigurations early on. And so it's key to have partners that really understand this stuff and, and can share the experiences of other clients. So this all sounds great, AJ. You're sharp, you know, financial background. Uh, what about the economics? You know, our survey data shows that security, it's at the top of the spending priority list, but budgets are stretched thin. I mean, especially when you think about the work from home pivot and, and all the areas that they had to, 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 the holes that they had to fill there, whether it was laptops, you know, new security models, et cetera. So how do organizations pay for this? What's the business case look like in terms of maybe reducing infrastructure costs so I can, you know, pay it forward or there's a, there's a risk reduction angle. What can you share there? Yeah, I mean, the, the perspective I'd like to give here is um, not being multi-cloud as multi-copies of an application or, or, or data. When I think back 20 years, a lot of the work in financial services I was looking at was managing copies of data that were feeding different pipelines, different applications. Now, what we're seeing at ITAHO, a lot of the work that we're doing is reducing the number of copies of that data so that if I've got a product lifecycle management set of data. If I'm a manufacturer, I'm, I'm just going to keep that in one location. But across my different clouds, I'm going to have best of breed applications developed in-house, third parties in collaboration with my supply chain, connecting securely to that, um, that single version of the truth. What I'm not going to do is to copy that data. So a lot of what we're seeing now is that interconnectivity using applications built on Kubernetes um, that are decoupled from the data source that allows us to reduce those copies of data. Within that, you're gaining from the security capability and resilience because you're not leaving yourself open to those multiple copies of data. And with that comes come cost, cost of storage and uh, cost of compute. So what we're seeing is using multi-cloud to leverage the best of what each cloud platform has to offer. And that goes all the way to Snowflake and Heroku on uh, cloud managed databases too. Well, and the people cost too, as well, when you think about, yes, the copy creep, but then, you know, when something goes wrong, a human has to come in and figure it out. Um, you, know, you brought up Snowflake, they get this vision of the data cloud, which is, you know, data, yep. data, I, I, I think this, we're, we're going to be rethinking AJ, uh, uh, data architectures in the coming decade where data stays where it belongs, it's distributed yep. and, and you're providing access. Like you said, you're separating the data from the applications, applications as we talked about with Fadzi, much more portable. So it's, it's really the last 10 years and be different than the next 10 years, AJ. Definitely, I, I think the people cost reduction is, is huge. Gone are the days where you needed to 
have uh, a dozen people governing, managing, and planning policies to data. A lot of that repetitive work, those tasks, can be in part automated. We've seen examples in, in insurance where we've reduced teams of, of 15 people working in the, the back office trying to apply security controls, compliance, down to just a couple of people who are looking at the exceptions um, that don't fit. And that's really important because maybe two years ago, the emphasis was on regulatory compliance of data uh, with policies such as GDPR and CCPA. Last year, very much the economic effect of reduced headcounts and, and enterprises running lean, looking to reduce their costs. This year, we can see that already some of the more proactive companies are looking at um, initiatives such as net zero emissions. How do they use data to under, understand how, how they can become more, have a better social impact um, and using data to drive that. And that's across all of their operations and supply chain. So those regulatory com, uh, compliance issues that may have been external, we see um, similar patterns emerging for internal initiatives that are benefiting the environment, social impact, and, and of course, cost. Great perspectives. You know, Jeff Hammerbacher once famously said, the, the best minds of my generation are trying to get people to click on ads. And AJ, those examples that you just gave of you know, social good and, and, and moving uh, uh, things forward are, are really critical. And I think that's where data is going to have the biggest societal impact. Okay, guys, great conversation. Thanks so much for coming to the program. Really appreciate your time. All right, keep it right there for more insight and conversation around creating a resilient digital business model. You're watching theCUBE.